Welcome back to Common Ground, an inside look at Suffolk County. I'm your host, Sheriff Steve Tompkins. Now, on this side of the show, we've got Molly Baldwin, CEO of Roca. Uh, not only in Chelsea any longer, they're in Chelsea, but they're also out in Springfield. And we're trying to get them up here in Boston. They're working with about 40 kids from Boston. And what they do is they work with the very um, high at risk kids, ages 20, uh, 14 to 24, to basically keep them out of harm's way, keep them away from violence, and help them really mature and grow into the response responsible citizens that we'd all like them to be. So without any further ado, thank you so very much for coming on. Well, thank you, Sheriff. I'm excited. This is the first time I've done a show with you as the sheriff. It so is. That's awesome. right. You yes. have been here a couple of <laughs> yes, times, I but have. that's right. So this I'm is, excited to come today. It's awesome. It's always exciting to, to have you here, principally not only because you're just a great, outstanding person and a real good thank public you. servant, but what you're doing with ROCA is extraordinary. Why don't you tell the viewers a little bit more about what ROCA is built to do? Great. So, you know, over the years, as I, I think as we've shared with you, we hope we've done more good than bad. But really in the past six, seven years, we've worked really hard on driving to outcomes and really helping the community's highest risk young men right. change their behavior. So we're very focused, 17 to 24, young men assessed at high risk for continued violence and incarceration who sort of refuse to do everything. They don't go to work, they won't go to a training program, they spend a lot of time being busy about I'm not really sure what. Right. Um, <laughs> And what we've done is really look at um, the evidence and the data about what it takes to help these young men really change their behavior and succeed. Yeah. So we've really created a two-year intensive model with two years of follow-up. We have four components of the program. Our signatures, you may remember, we call relentless outreach, which is probably a legal word for stalking. I mean, we just follow kids <laughs> around. We bang on the door. I probably shouldn't say that to the sheriff. Yeah. Um, you know, we bang on the door. We find their friends, their mothers, their boys, whoever, and we'll triangulate around them until we find them over and over and over again. Okay. And we go out and we build relationships. The second thing is... Um, the literature is really clear, just like with your own children. People tend to grow and change in the context of a relationship. Right. So our case management model is really built on what we call a transformational relationship. So we have one youth worker who works with 25 young people in the first two years, and then it's less intensive in the future. And then the next piece we do is we bring them into programming around education, employment, and pre-vocational training and life skills, okay. because they need the skills to succeed. Exactly. So the trick is with this group, they don't show up, right? So if they were a group that showed up, they wouldn't need to be at ROCA. They could be at one of the many fabulous training programs in the city, sure. or Year Up, or Youth Build, or community college programs, or other training programs. So we've essentially built a get your life together school. We bang on their door, we haul them out of bed, we drag them into programming over and over again, whether they like it, don't like us, love us today, hate us today, blow up today, what? until they start to come themselves. Um, a really great example about kind of what does this change take. For example, we run transitional employment crews. They get paid minimum wage because the research says real pay for real money. On Wednesdays, they have to do educational programming where they don't get paid. It generally takes them 15 to 18 months to put 60 days in a row in. Okay. And we think, mm, okay. you probably ought to put 60 days in a row in before you get a job. Right. Um, so we're looking at about 18 to 24 months to see sustained behavior change. Uh, we track what young people do. We track what staff does. We take a look at how we can get better and what gives us the privilege to be in their lives. And then on the back end, they need support over time, but they don't need that level of intensity. We found that that actually wasn't so helpful. Right. So we drop the intensity off, but we don't really go anywhere mm -hmm. and really help them in the long-term picture of their lives. So let me ask you this. Now, you've been around for 20, 26 25 years, 26 mm -hmm. years. Congratulations. Brains are fully developed now. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> well. We um, but... A few years back, you really shifted over mm -hmm. to evidence-based data that shows you what exactly. What do you get out of the evidence-based right. evidence data? So, wh so what happened was, Sheriff, we were looking at, I mean, we did a lot of things. We had a lot of fun. I don't know. I, thought, I hope we did more good than bad. But right. we, quite honestly, we had no idea. And we really looked at the highest-risk young men, gang involved, weapons charges, in and out of prison, and they'd come to Roca and they'd build their self-esteem and they'd feel fabulous. And then they'd go home and they'd deal drugs and shoot people. Right. And we're like, uh, not what good. Happened? Right. Brought everything to a complete halt. We migrated over to the literature, evidence base really, of community corrections. There's sort of eight evidence-based practices. Um, everything from risk assessments to you know, doing skills behavior and behavior change methodology and connecting them to natural communities and supports and celebrating their successes. Um, 
and really then started using data. I mean, our theory of change, if you will, is that through long-term relationships and skills development, they can change. And this group that we pretty much write off, they're either going to die young or go to prison forever. Right. We really can engage. And we think if you do more of this and less of that, you'll get better. So we've been using that evidence over the years and really building the case for a model. Um, over, you know, there's sort of three commonly accepted stages of demonstrating an evidence-based model, and we've, we're sort of straddling stage two and three. We can, we have a clear model. We sort of do the same thing every day. We're getting similar results, um, and now we're looking forward to a more robust evaluation. And the end game is to reduce the criminal behavior and incarceration right. and help them go to work. Right. Um, I heard another politician from another state say this, so we've been saying it every day since. There is no progress without a job. And they have to learn to go to work. It may not be the most glamorous job, right. but, you, but if you're not working, right. then you're going to be in the street. But they also ha have to know how to comport themselves right. on the job site. You know, And right. attitude adjustment is a big, big, big deal, right. particularly for folks who have never been on a job site. Totally. So that's yeah. why we do all the transitional employment. That's why we build, we literally have GED programming, basic education programming, life right. skills, because they don't really know how to show up. Right. So you can come today in the beginning and hate us tonight, then threaten us tomorrow, and then we'll go get you, and then we'll bring you back in. And we use data to look at what we need to do to get better so that more often than not, not we're not perfect. Right. We don't have a magic pill here, but it's really based on behavior change. The, as you know, in the field of corrections, what they call cognitive restructuring, fancy language for learn to think different, to act different. Exactly. The whole model is built from an informal to a formal sort of array of, of behavior of the staff and the organization to help them learn to think different, to act different. So we can interact with them all day long and get them thinking differently. And the skills development is, can tolerate them not being able to show up until they do. And then we use the data every day to go, okay, if we do more of this and less of this, we increase the odds that young people are moving through this process. And you found this to be successful. We found it much more successful. We've, we, we've shown a dramatic reduce, reducing in future incarceration and right. increase in employment. Um, our data helps us be highly accountable. I mean, you, you know this. I and know so you. Does mm -hmm. the data also help you when you're looking for grants? I mean, so when you can say we've got hard and fast oh, data absolutely. that speaks to the fact yes. that these initiatives are working, yeah. will a granting organization look at you more favorably? Oh, totally. Okay. I mean, totally. I mean, if you, I mean, we cut to outcomes first, Sheriff, because like you, we love young people. Mm -hmm. We love them. Right. And we wanted to do something of value. Their life has had enough dumb stuff, quite right. honestly, right. bad right. stuff. Right. They've been hurt. They've hurt other people, this group. So what gives you the privilege to be in their lives every day? So we need to use that data, like you do for your children at school. Exactly. You look at your school's exactly. report cards, your right. kids' report cards. And so we got to outcomes, really. You know, people say, would you do it because of grants? I'm like, it helps. It's a game changer. Mm -hmm. But we really got to it because we wanted to make sure we were worthy of these young people. Mm -hmm. And if we couldn't know that what we're doing is more helpful than not, then we shouldn't be here. So uh, a few months back, um, there was a lot in the news about this pay for success model right. that Roca is championing. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that and what is that all about? Yeah, so, oh, this, is, and this is an extraordinary opportunity. So in its simplest form, since I am not the uh, greatest of intellect, in its simplest form, governments do things with vulnerable populations right. who, and cost a lot of money and they're not getting the results they want. So right. in several states, Massachusetts being one of the leading states, the government made available um, opportunities for these things called pay for success. And really, it's an opportunity for another organization to do something for that group of people, demonstrate better outcomes and cost less money. And okay. then the government pays on the back end. Okay. So literally you pay for success. So the project we're in is about reducing in future incarceration. Okay. And um, with high-risk young men who are on track for going incarceration, and the state set aside $27 million in what they call success payments. Okay. And there's some federal dollars as well for success payments. Okay. And the idea is the state and the feds won't pay for five years. And they're going to look at, did ROCA reduce incarceration of the young people it served as compared to a group it didn't? So for five years, you're doing this work, but you're not receiving any money? Well, the government doesn't get paid. So the question is, like affordable, if you're going to build housing, if you can kind of akin to affordable housing, you need a capital stack up front. Right. 
So what the government chose was an intermediary, third sector capital partners, and they essentially put the capital stack together. Okay. And it's pretty extraordinary. It has senior Wall Street debt from Goldman Sachs. Okay. It has junior debt from two foundations, Living Cities Foundations and okay. the Kresge Foundation, and philanthropy from the John and Arnold Foundation, the Boston Foundation, and New Profit. It's some big names. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. And then Roca also decided to be a 15% investor. We're raising philanthropy for our 15% okay. because we thought we ought to have skin in the game. And if we hit our goals, we'll get that money back and create a renewable source of funding. So it is, um, it's, it's an unbelievable opportunity to think that Wall Street, foundations, new profit, the government could come together for this particular group of young people, yeah. put enough capital together to really demonstrate the model. Talk about a public-private uh, partnership. It's wild. It's you know. wild. How did this begin? Who's, was this your initiative? I mean, who, who had the brainchild to do well, pay for I, success? I think the first iteration of this kind, I mean, there are other types of government contracts based on outcomes in the country, but this kind of model, in the United Kingdom, I think they started a similar type project, okay. and they kind of kicked the ball down the field. And then some organizations in this country got really excited about the idea and started promoting it. Um, New York City has one under the former mayor. Um, the Massachusetts okay. does, right? right? The state of Utah. Now there are probably about 12, 13 other states really looking at these kind of things. And so it's, you know, how do you really have enough resources so you can do the right thing for people, help them change without having to stop every three minutes and figure out how to pay the bills, right. um, and demonstrate a level of evidence that, in fact, people can have their lives back. So the thing that always resonates with us, there's several things, but one that I'll cite here is, or a couple that I'll cite here is the cost of education, 13 to 20,000, mm -hmm. versus incarceration, 46,000. Right. The number of people that we incarcerate in this country, which is way off the charts. Right. And in my facility, you have 85% um, of the people that are there have some involvement with drugs, 42% right. present with some form of mental illness. Right. Um, in the Commonwealth, we have about 17.7. The demographic for blacks and Latinos is about 17.7, right. .7, north of 65 percent, you know, in my facility. Right. So when you talk about keeping folks out of jail, mm -hmm. you know, we also have to look at the need for more mental health detox beds, the right. need for more jobs, particularly in trades. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the day, there used to be vocational schools and the right. like. Does your model at some point look at some of those other dynamics, i.e. mental health, detox, more jobs in the trades? And, yep. and, and so when you talk about keeping people out of harm's way, keep them out of trouble, do you right. factor that all in? So we factor all those things in. The most, um, so Roka works really well for very high risk young offenders. Right. For low and moderate risk, we're overdoing it and we'll make them worse. It's not a good place. I see. Um, the, as you know, the best practices in substance abuse and in mental health are really, you know, the cognitive restructuring and motivational interviewing. So that's built into the daily fabric as well as formal evidence-based curriculums, if you will. Um, the whole model is getting people to think different, to act different. This doesn't tend to be a group that, you know, willfully goes off to counseling. Right. So uh, we use every lever we can. So, for example, you're going to go to transitional employment. If you keep losing your job because you're high, then we're going to get you on a treatment or a detox bed. Um, uh -huh. We've gone out and made all kinds. Instead of saying, no, you can't come till you're clean, because then they'll just be pissed off and leave. So we use every leverage we can to do everything we can. We work with partners in the mental health field. We try to raise money. So we nice. have what we call roaming counselors. So they'll come out on the street with us when we can which wow. is really helpful and okay. important. Okay. Um, the skills thing gets really important. This job thing is very interesting, right? So they have felony charges, right? Absolutely. They have pretty strong quarries. It's right. not like they're going to go whistling into... you talking about into that very high-risk uh, cohort. Group. You're right, exactly. Right. And so what you had to do is we had to go, okay, where are they going to start in jobs? I, you know, maybe later they can be somewhere else, but let's get real here. We've got to live right. in this world. Um, and so we built a range of programming, pre-vocational, all the way to the job training and partnerships with employers to help them get to realistic entry points. And all through that continuum, are you mm -hmm. consistently tweaking, refining the attitude adjustment all the portion time. of that, so right? Attitude because from one stage mm -hmm. to the next to the next, the attitude adjustment could get more difficult or maybe less, but right. it has to be refined, you know, so step five can't look like step one. Right. So okay. it's all, and, you know, we sort of look at it through the, you know, both the, you know, the, the learning to think different, to act different 
lens. That's kind of our big lens, so right. it's constant, right? right? And you're right, you know, young people need as much support to get engaged as they do when they first get a job. Right. Because, uh, you know, everything will be great, Roka's great, doing well, the key project's great, transitional employment, now I got this advanced partner, I'm doing work over here with Beacon Communities, it's going awesome, now you want me to leave? Right. No, I don't think so. Right. You know, and so we have to, you know, you have to lay in that intensity then again, right? We right. actually found through our data, uh, you may remember this, we used to just hang around with you forever. Yeah, you know, we loved young people, we right. didn't know what work, we'll do what, however long it takes. Well, our data showed us if we kept that intensity up after two years, people were not only relapsing, they were regressing. And that actually matches some of the substance abuse treatment oh, programs. So we had to kind of back off a little okay. bit. Now, we don't totally go right. away, and we can help you. Because they were like, well, why would I leave? This is great. Well, no, you're not supposed to be with us forever. Wean them off. Yeah, you're supposed to leave Try us, to right? So we got to help right. you go. That's right. right. So, um, th so we've learned a lot. You know, we have a lot more. We, uh, you know, every year we have a continuous improvement list. You know, us, we got to get to the next thing. Right. Um, but every year we kind of got two or three major things we're trying to work on to get better at with this model and use the data. And then we're kind of always scanning every, you know, the criminal justice field, the substance abuse field, the job training field. To see field, what works. To see what works. And, and what steal, doesn't. Right, and steal any good idea right, we can. Right. I mean, we'll give you credit. We don't have a problem with that. But, you know, it's really how do you help them grow. Talk to me about their home life situation. Talk to me about their home front. I mean, a, a right. lot of these kids from broken homes, single parent households, what's right. that look like? So mo yeah, most of them, home is not a great place. There's not uh -huh. enough parenting going on. Uh -huh. Between 17 and 24, even if home is great, you're not really too cozy with your parents anyway. Um, some of their homes are pretty <laughs> dangerous, that. right? right? right, right. Um, some of them go from place to place to place. You know, people are like, well, you need to give them housing. I'm like, well, having been a person who used to bring kids home, um, if they could do well in housing, they probably wouldn't need ROCA. And so we kind of got to go through this drill with them until they stabilize and then work on the housing. We are constantly negotiating deals. So the few uh, shelters who work with young adults um, are, love our staff, but they, are, they won't barely take our calls anymore. They're like, they'll call, you know, Dana will call and they'll go, oh no, Dana. We haven't gotten over the last one who blew out of here. I see. We're not helping you. I got you. So we're constantly helping kids negotiate with families or right. friends to stay in or pay rent. And, but once they start to square their life away, then it works. So it's really about being quite realistic and helping them get from here to there. So in this process, mm -hmm. are the families intimately involved, or is it just your focus is just on the our, 17 to 24 year right. old? Our focus is primarily on the individuals. Uh -huh. um, if they have a family member who wants to be, we will. You know, we, we go and go to their homes. We'll engage with family and parents. Uh, we use this peacemaking circle methodology, which uh -huh. is an alternative communication process that right. works with families and parents. Um, we'll certainly, you know, we'll dance with anybody who wants to help them. Um, but um, most of them aren't around or it doesn't work, you know. I think the other thing that's important to say about ROCA, and, and people sort of forget this, we don't really care if the young person wants to be there. You We're, don't care. We don't really care. You know, they're not particularly <laughs> mandated to Roka. You know, right. we'd like to try that someday. Right. We believe someday we want to work with you actually to be a formal alternative to incarceration someday. We think oh, we're benchmarking to that. Hey, we need more diversionary yes. programs. We need more mental health uh, mental health beds and, and detox beds. I agree with you. We on think that, one. that this is the road to it. Yeah. But you have to remember, like people are like, well, you know, what if Jose or you know John doesn't want to be there? Yeah. I don't care. They fit the profile, they're in. Right. We don't lose you. Right. Most, because most young men at this risk level, they're not doing anything anyway. So right. if they like us, it's not for very long. But see, that's the tough part of any initiative like this is sustaining it, the right. sustainability. And so mm -hmm. it seems like you folks have your arms around the fact that you know a lot of these young adults are going to be reluctant to this. Yes. But you have to keep coming back and you have to keep coming right. back and you have to and you have to and right. you have to because it's not easy work. But without that sustainability, okay, so years ago I did some work with um, DCF, which used to be mm -hmm. called DSS, Department of uh, right. Social Services. And what they said oftentimes is, particularly with young teenagers that are mm -hmm. going to be adopted or in that, that, that space for adoption, right. once they're adopted, they will do things consistently to have you push them away again. Absolutely. Because they feel that, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say they're not worthy, but they're going to test right. to see if you really love them, if you really want them. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like this is kind of the totally. same it's situation. Back-end parenting. Right, exactly. Back-end parenting, yeah. you know, there's now evidence, there's another brain development piece in the early 20s 
and we don't really care if you like us. At some point it works out, and every young person who goes through Roka will tell you they were just so annoying, I got exhausted. And uh, we do, um, <laughs> another note is that we have expectations of a staff member how much they need to see a young person. Okay. And we publish that data amongst the staff every single week. You can't go to supervision unless you bring your data in from the data system. Wow. And we use that data because we love young people. We use that data to tell us if we're doing what we're supposed to do right. or not. Are we on track or not? Right. Because they're worthy of it. So that's really critical. So how many counselors, how many social, how many caseworkers do you have, and how many kids are assigned to one individual? So in the early phase, the first two years, phase one and phase two, it's a one to 25 ratio. Okay. So every 25 young people, there's a youth worker. Right. In the second phase, it's a one to 60 ratio. So we drop off that intensity on purpose. Okay. And then we have crew supervisors who run our work crews, and we have teachers who do the pre-voke and the education. Okay. And then coordinators. So that's no. how the op program runs. And do you also have any sort of peer-to-peer -peer interaction? with the kids amongst themselves trying to mm -hmm. work and educate and groom and further the initiatives themselves. Right, so a lot of the group contacts, the peacemaking circles is real peer-to-peer -peer interaction. The basic transitional employment, they're all in a work crew. Sure, so Nobody's sure. going by themselves right. anywhere. Uh, absolutely. And they're absolutely. all line of sight supervision. Yeah. Um, then, you know, we do a lot of other group work. We're using Thinking for Change, the CBT curriculum. We do some substance abuse groups. So in a lot of those contexts, we do that. And, and the reason that. I ask about peer-to-peer -peer is because mm -hmm. in any group, you'll have some that will advance quicker than others. Right. And those that advance quicker can turn around and say, okay, so I've walked that path. Right. I, you don't know what's coming, but I know what's coming. Right. And so, and that's different from you or one of your caseworkers right. or me or someone like that that has not walked that path turning around to work. And right. that, I find value in peer-to-peer. -peer. One of the things that we're talking about with our education programs mm -hmm. at the department is in some of the classes, mm -hmm. we're going to actually let inmates teach that's the great. class. Right on. You see? Mm -hmm. Because there's growth in that. Right. You know, I mean, I call it the, the school of hard knocks or the school of experience. Right. You know, everybody's not built for the textbook. Right. You know, but the experiential, when you actually do it, mm -hmm. not only do you learn more, well, I mean, not only does the other person learn more, but you learn more about your capabilities and your abilities right. to then really be meaningful. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Absolutely. that makes sense to you. Yeah, yeah, no, the whole sort of each one teach one idea, which yeah. is just great. We have, um, on the work crew, you can become a senior Right. crew member and right. help lead stuff and right. there you can there's growth in our work crew model we have an internal cleaning and maintenance crew so that you get better so you can see that and right. then we've created we have some pretty extraordinary partnerships with um, both state entities and um, private entities speaking communities for example where we run an advanced work crew where they're nice. getting paid more their you know work expectations are up but we still get to kind of be in their business because the entity pays us to pay the kid, right. uh, the young person, and um, if they do well, there's also job opportunities. It's like a pretty high-level temp to perm opportunity in many places as well. It's pretty exciting. So you began in Chelsea. I know you uh, mm -hmm. expanded out to Springfield. I right. mentioned in the open that you've got 40 kids that you're working with in, in Boston. Beyond East Boston. Yeah. We've been in East Boston for 24 of the 26 years. Okay, okay. Yep. So talk to me about the expansion. Mm -hmm. Is that... Is that fraught with uh, obstacles or, I mean, you, you, you've kind of got it down. You know what you're doing. You know how right. to do what you've got to do. You've got to identify the kids that you want to pull into the program. When you venture into a Springfield or right. into beyond East Boston, right. how successfully is that happening? So the Springfield replication is three and a half years old. We're doing really well. We've learned a lot. And through Pay for Success, it'll take us right through the rest of Hamden County. And then through Pay for Success, we get to come to Boston beyond East Boston. Um, for the most part, young people will be assigned to us by the evaluator. We don't get to go pick them. We actually have an unusual opening right now where we get to do some self-referral, which we'd like to talk to you about. Um, so they'll be referred, and we're um, excited to work with you and your team and really create a plan for our Boston replication. Our intention at some point is to get a storefront, and then assuming things go well, we have a sense of scale based on numbers in the city about what would be helpful. We're very clear kind of on what our lane is. I mean, you have lots of great organizations in the city. Right. And um, we're pretty clear we're not doing things other people are. You've got outreach workers doing great work. Right. You've got training right. programs. You've got youth centers. We're really about that kind of behavior change, long-term, 
you know, for a group that can't go to those other places. Yeah. And so we're thrilled and honored to kind of be coming to this part of Boston as well. And um, we, we, you know, we hope at some point in the next three to four months to have a storefront and if things nice. go well. A place like Springfield, the Springfield building, as you know, is about 5,000 square feet. Nice building. I've it's seen, a great I've building, yes. Yeah, nice so it's, it's a special project. Right, it really um, is nice. And we're going to build out about 2,000 more square feet. So we're really excited. Out of Springfield? Yeah. Oh, nice. Two back buildings. Okay. Where you build out. Yeah. That's nice. Mm -hmm. All right, look, we're, we're, we're just about out of time. Mm -hmm. If folks want more information about what you folks are doing, Oh, yeah. Please call us at Roca or look us up. Uh, it's, you know, it's rocainc.org is a website. R-O-C-A. R-O-C-A, right. right. Okay. And, um, you know, Got give us a number? call. 617-889-5210. It's okay. great. All right, Molly, you got to come back again. Once you get into Boston and you're doing some more of this great, wonderful stuff, we'd love to have you come back on to talk about that expansion. And we'll talk even further. I know that you're looking at Baltimore at some point down the road. Maybe Baltimore so like to, or somewhere else. Right. Yep. Talk to you about that. So thanks for coming on today. We really Thank you. Appreciate Love it. doing it with you, Sheriff. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right, folks. Look, that's our show for today. We're out of time. We're out of here. We'll be back again next week. So until then, you take care of yourself. Peace.